Um, I'm going to tell you a little story about Tunisia and what role that collective bargaining played in that country over the last um, few years. And it's a really great story. Um, you know, collective bargaining at its essence is a compact between the people in a way and, and, its, and the society. And it's also a compact between um, people, workers, and their union. And in this sense, it played a really critical role in the revolution in, um, in Tunisia. It actually was at this kind of true heart of, of collective bargaining that the flames of the revolution in Tunisia were tended during the long years of, of a repressive dictatorship in that country. Um, in December of 2010, probably there weren't too, too many of you in this room who had heard very much about Tunisia. It was another, you know, kind of Middle Eastern country that was um, kind of a repressive dictatorship, full of inequities, didn't have much, uh, um, you know, outside knowledge about the country. And, you know, there wasn't much going on there that was of interest to labor rights activists, frankly. Then a working man um, who was at the end of his rope, he was no longer able to support his family um, on the streets of Tunisia where he had to sell vegetables and fruits and he was no longer able to find a way through the despair and the humiliation of his life and his inability to provide for his family and he set himself on fire. And that fire became like a beacon for the other people in his country and the other people in his country who had similarly been kind of rejected um, by the system and marginalized um, by both the economic and the political systems. And this fire was seen and felt by, especially by the young people in that country. And they saw it and they felt it and they started talking about it and it sent them to the streets where they started a protest that was very much a protest about dignity and rage and how could it be that somebody was so in such despair that they would set themselves on fire over the inability to make a living, something as simple as that. At the beginning, at, at this time in Tunisia, organized labor was not at, on the streets at the, at the very, very beginning of this situation. And at that time, labor was looking and they, they kind of had to make a choice. And there were people watching the situation wondering, in fact, what would organized labor do? Because in that country, there was a large labor movement. It's called, it's the UGTT, it's like the equivalent of the AFL-CIO, right? It's a large national structure for labor unions. And it had been part of, it's a labor movement that had been living under an extreme dictatorship for many, many years. Its history had been, it was part, very proud part of the independence struggle in Indonesia. I mean, sorry, in Tunisia. And it had been part of what brought about freedom in that country in the early years of the country's independence. It was a large trade union movement, some 500,000 members. And it had members in both the public sector and the private sector. And it was also the acknowledged bargaining partner um, of the of the, of the employers and the government. So it actually did engage in every three years, it was the bargaining partner for, with the state and the, and the employers. And so it had an official role in bargaining for the wages and working conditions of the, of the people. But it was also an institution that lived under an extreme dictatorship where there is, was no political freedom and where there was no freedom of expression and there was no opposition allowed. And so it was very much hamstrung and there were accommodations, no doubt, that were made to this political situation. And so there were people who were wondering what role would the trade unions play. And so it became um, 
And they had also been themselves as an institution struggling with a diminished role within within the within the um, within the country, they had been, been an independence fighter. They had played this important role in developing a socialist economy in the early years of Tunisia, in achieving economic rights for the people. But with the economic changes in the 80s and the 90s, they too had begun to see their power as an institution rolled back as they tried to stop the erosion of worker rights in that country. So this was the situation when. Um, when the events of 2010 began. But what happened was that as the people, the young people took to the streets, out in the countryside, the trade union folks out in the countryside basically looked out and said, this is the real thing. The people are out on the streets and this is the real thing. And they began to call around, call to their leaders in the city, call one another and say, this is the real thing. We need to join this. These are our people out on the streets, and we want to be part of it. And very quickly, the trade unions became leapt into the fray and became part of the core of this uprising against the Ben Ali regime. This became an essential part of the uprising. When the UGTT, and its many structures um, became part of the uprising. They established safe houses for protesters coming from the streets. They sat with the families of the martyrs who had been killed, and they brought food and flowers. They attended the funerals of people who had been killed. They um, provided phones. They set up phone trees. They called, you know, they had their, they had the networks already established. They got people to the streets. They pulled the leaders in from some of the higher up leaders. They pulled them in when they were a little reluctant. They provided leadership for this revolution that was really critical. And with the sparking of this revolution, it's also really important to, to note that the political parties at the time were completely non-existent. So that the UGTT, the trade union movement, the labor movement, was the only movement in the country that had the national reach to to take on something like a revolution because everybody else had been decimated during the time.